Good evening, and again, it's my privilege to greet you in the precious name of Christ Jesus, my Lord, ever desiring that all honor, glory, and praise would be lifted up unto him, and that whatsoever we do in word or deed, that it might indeed be in his name and for his glory, and that thus we might be built up in the most holy faith, better enabled, as it were, to comprehend the things of God, and realizing that we shall never be able to know it to its fullest, but rather that we might indeed be ever increasing in the knowledge of Him, that we might ever be grown in faith toward Him, that we might ever be in the way of experiencing even greater joy and greater delight as we think upon Him. Again, I would urge you that you be much in prayer for each other, and as we think in terms of that, uh, we think of the one of the offices of our Lord himself, and that is he's an intercessor. He is our, he intercedes for us. Hebrews 7 tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for his people, and in this then we rejoice. But if we would serve after the example of Christ, this is why the apostle would teach us that we pray without ceasing, that we pray for each other, that we pray in such a way that, again, the kingdom of God might be promoted within us and among us, and thus that we might ever be in that way of spiritual involvement with him above all else. Now, again, uh, as I said, I urge you that you do pray and pray for each other, and especially where we know of situations and circumstances. But I think in regard to the churches, God has, for a purpose, caused us to come together, to be identified together as a body of Christ, and therefore bearing those that spiritual image of our identity with the Lord Jesus Christ as being fully submitted unto him, but also as members one of another. And Ephesians 4 describes very beautifully that interactive and interrelationship that we know uh, and that we as one, the joints fitly framed together and they minister to each other. And so this we would have you to do. Be uh, advised, as we all are, that we are living in perilous times. There are many things afoot that would, if they could, um, do away with every thought of God. I read something just recently that there was a time back in history, and it was quite some time ago, but... In any event, it was within the last four or five hundred years that there was an attempt made to go to a 10-day week. And you might think, well, how ridiculous is that? Well, when you understand that the objective was to direct people's attention away from God, and this is one thing that we have even as a testimony that nobody even thinks about it. There's seven days in a week. They understand that. Obviously, they are not given to turning one of those days over fully to the Lord, calling it the Lord's Day. But on the other hand, it connects us back to the creation that it took seven days or he of seven days that he created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested. And so I'm sure that with some who are trying to deny that we're uh, the work of divine creation and that not some accident that evolved over millions and billions of years, but rather that we are the creation of God uh, and that we have thus, and it wasn't that far back by any stretch of the imagination, but in any event, that we have that reminder ever before us, the seven days. And so think upon God. Next time you think, what day of the week is it? 
which day on what did God create on which day? We know on the first day what he did, on the second day what he did, on the third day what he did, on the fourth day. And we know that on the seventh day he rested. And so it is that we would ever be drawn to him. Let's look to him just now in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the privilege of opening your word. And I ask, O oh God, that you would cause he, the Holy Spirit, to guide and direct that which we would do here, so that honor and glory would be unto thee, and that we would be built up and encouraged in the most holy faith. I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I want to take you this evening to uh, 1 Corinthians. And there in chapter 2, I want to deal with what I consider to be one of the most important uh, of New Testament passages. We're going to read there just the first five verses. And it's not that I would exalt one portion of the Word of God over another. It is rather that I would just simply have us to see and to understand that there are some things where uh, there are salient principles set forth, there are cardinal truths declared, there are those things which are most important to our understanding, and part of it has to do with the witness of what transpired in the early days uh, following the death, burial, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the epistles, we look back into much of the history of the apostolic era, and that is when the apostles, those who knew the Lord Jesus Christ, when miracles were being worked among them and where truly the gospel was being set forth and established and it was being spread throughout the known world. And so it's important that we come to these things. Now, first of all, I'm going to read, and then I'll comment just a little bit more on the importance of this. Paul, in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I'm going to end the reading there. There's much more, really, that pertains to this. And I am addressing this under the thought or under the title, if you will, that your faith should stand. And how does it stand? On what basis is it founded? And wherein do we experience the continuation and the operations of faith in us? And so, again, may God bless the reading of his word. And even as we look here, we're reminded of various places in the scripture where there were miraculous things that took place, where the empowering, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, and we have been speaking much in these recent lessons over the past several weeks, as a matter of fact, concerning the operation and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And once again, we come to a place here where we find a reference, if you will, to the Trinity. And I say that for this reason, uh, that uh, herein he speaks of the testimony of God. And um, it is concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm determined not to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, and then declares that in verse 4 that his speech and his preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit once again declared together in the Scripture. 
And thus we endeavor always to honor our God and to do so in the trinity of his persons, that great mystery that we do not understand. And here again, even the margin has it here with regard to uh, testimony or the thought of testimony that some of the manuscripts read mystery. But regardless of what, it is the declaration of God. And so I think it's important that we do this or that we think in this way. And we just recently, as a matter of fact, in our last lesson, we dealt with the issue of uh, the, the operations of the Spirit of God as it appeared at the, in the church at Thessalonica. And there we read for, again, concerning the gospel in verse 5 of that first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And so this evidence or this witness, if you will, the Holy Spirit is something that is there and is manifested to us and we'll sort of deal this evening with the way in which that is so. Uh, Paul, in this passage of Scripture, is reminding. Now, the Corinthians, and when we think of First and Second Corinthians, we think of the fact that there were some problems that had arisen. These were New Testament churches, or was a New Testament church, and that there were good people there, there were God's people, they were and making errors. There were some things that had crept in. And so there he addressed early in the first chapter the matter of divisions among them, sort of trying to factionalize themselves. We will see that there was, as we go on in this book, that there were some sins that were taking place that they weren't simply weren't dealing with it. It was in their midst and it needed to be addressed. But as is so often done, and and I think in terms of Paul's epistle to the Galatians, in which he begins with the reminder of what the work of the Spirit had been among them, and that they were witnesses to those things, had experienced those very things of which he spoke, and that that was an issue with John in, in his epistles. He would make reference to past experiences, things that had transpired that should have been continuing. And so this matter, and I have often heard this, and it's a grave error. It's a, it can be a very fatal error that men make in which they refer to some initial experience that they have had, but there's no continuation and, and this is one of the things that does continually unfold. And it is so important as we make reference to the things of the Word of God that implied, if not stated, that there will be continuation where there is an operation of the Spirit of God. So this was what Paul was dealing with here in this passage of Scripture. He's reminding them of what the initial experience was like as he preached the gospel to them, and they bore witness within their hearts with that the 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 regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, the energizing power of the Holy Spirit that brought them to true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, their spiritual gifts, there are those things that we must have, and thus we fall upon his mercy. We look to the mercy of God to see that these things certainly do come to pass. And so Paul then does this. He refers them to some things that are extremely critical as far as we're concerned. And so the, 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 the fact that they had witnessed these things gives Paul a point of reference. In other words, he was there and they were there and they experienced the same thing. And so, again, it's not always that even as I preach to you that I might be able to say, well, you remember when you and I went through this together? 
However, over the years, there has been much preaching that I have done, and there's been much reaction to it, and there has been much in the way, and I take no credit for that. Here again, when the Holy Spirit attends upon the preaching of the gospel, honors the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is an effect not only upon those being preached to, but upon the one preaching those things. So it becomes very important that we understand this. And so Paul thus goes to the basic essentials. And this he does in a way that I think is most interesting because he said he didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I remember, and we can read in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, where Herod had sort of a, had elevated himself to a position of really people were saying, man, he's just like a god. And as he began to orate, as he spoke to them, they commented upon his oratorical ability and upon his words and just how wonderful they were. He didn't give God the glory, and he was eaten of worms there on the spot. And so we understand something about that. There are people who are very persuasive. They can be philosophical. They can be logical. They can do all sorts of things. But my friend, if they are not biblical, if they are not true to the Word of God as it is set forth in the Word of God, and we are warned forcefully in the book of Revelation that you do not add to or take anything away from the Word of God. And so that this Paul had, had to warn them about because there were many false teachers that showed up there were many that were offering alternative lifestyles. There were many that were looking to these things in such a way as to promote pride, human ability, and anything other than that which was clearly declared when Jesus Christ went to the cross, suffered and died as the substitute for his people under the wrath of God, and that he rose again the third day with that only life that we may find acceptable with God. And so, Paul's determination, and he says this, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's a simple message, and it's one that we need to lay hold upon. Now, what did he mean when he said he was determined to know nothing else? Well, I think that we can see that in two ways. There was a matter of determination for him. That is to say that I'm not, I, that's all I have on my mind. That is the essence of the message that I preach. It does, wasn't just a matter of, hey, Jesus was crucified, died, and buried, rose again the third day. That, and that's it. That's it. No, he dealt with, there's no question in my mind, that as he declared concerning the crucifixion of Christ, that he not only set forth the depravity of man, declaring therefore the absolute necessity of a substitute, that he declared that it was of God's doing, that salvation was being provided and that choice was being made, that it would be his atoning work that only could avail and would avail for his people. And so when we think in terms of these things, we understand that to preach Christ crucified, we've got to deal with why he was crucified and what was accomplished in the crucifixion. We're not dealing here in terms of mere symbols. We are talking about living and life-giving issues. And so this is what he was talking about. Christ crucified as the means to justification before God. And it was important that we understand that. And so Paul was not going to know anything else for himself as he preached that gospel. That would be at laying at the foundation. That would be the basis. There would be no interjecting of gimmicks. There would be no uh, throwing in of, well, we got to persuade them to do this and we got to trick them to do that. 
and we got to come up with new methods and new ideas. They're not doing what we tell them to. No, Paul had only one message, and it was to be heard. It was to be believed, and that would be that which would distinguish those who believe, those who do not. And thus it would be those who received it would bear evidence that it was in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's all he wanted them to know. So we, we see it in two ways. First of all, that which Paul would know for himself and that he would also know for them. And so the, the message, there it is. It was uh, not to be uh, uh, a matter of what man might come up with. It could be observed in them. It was to be seen. And so we look back to verse 1 and understand that it is the testimony of God. It is His message. And this we must understand. And that's why we stay so close to the Scripture. We dare not drift away from the Scripture for the simple reason that this is God's Word to us. I dare not take liberties. Who am I? to think that I could improve upon. I will try my best to explain as understanding is given me on the basis of what I see in the Scripture and under the leadership and guidance and full dependence upon the illumination of He, the Holy Spirit. And so that the, the, the source of all of this, the effect, we see several things. First of all, the effect on Paul. When he talks about it, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. What does he mean he was there in weakness? Paul had, there was no thought whatsoever that Paul was going to in his own strength. And so, in other words, no reliance on self. No, he, and, and as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul was probably the most learned of all of the apostles as far as education was concerned. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had studied under the doctors. He knew the Old Testament. He knew it like the back of his hand. And yet it came to life under the quickening power of the Holy Spirit so that he saw that those were the things that were testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for all of his knowledge, for all of his ability, he never flaunted his authority. He never looked and says, oh, but I'm smarter than you are. Or he didn't try to come across as one who had a greater handle or a deeper understanding. Hear him say that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, What of whom I am chief. And so he was in weakness. He had no pretensions about himself. Not only that, was he in weakness, but he was in fear. He knew whose word he was preaching. He was there in the fear of God. He had an appreciation for the majesty of God, for the power of God. And when you catch a glimpse of those things, when you understand the majesty of God, the splendor, that is his and his alone, the all-sufficiency, the completeness of his person, he who lacks nothing, is pure in his very essence, and I run out of superlatives to describe him, and yet my, and I stand before him, and woe is me, as Isaiah said when he saw him, for I am undone. I'm, I'm just taken apart. And there's, there's, there's no standing in me. And so Paul was there in that way. He was in awe of God. And he was preaching while he was in awe of God. And the outward effect upon him was he trembled. He was dealing with that consciousness and with the effect of those things upon him. And so he saw the source. And it's so important in this we would come to especially. And my speech was not, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. And how often do we see it now? I despair every time I see or hear 
a man standing up in front of a crowd, begging and pleading with people, trying to get them to do what God alone can do when they simply should set forth Jesus Christ and him crucified as the only means of salvation, the only pro approach upon God, and to bid them to fall upon the mercy of God. To go further than that is trying to it, it brings something out of man, and I, they, they believe it. They really believe that there is something within man that can be somehow conjured up in such a way as to render his testimony or his action fit for acceptance with God. It's nowhere to be found in the Scripture. That is the, the, the work of man's wisdom, and God has made the wisdom of man foolish. He's made it to appear that way. He's made it to be seen in that way. So it's not going to stand. He doesn't want their faith to stand in the foolishness of, of man's wisdom, but rather his preaching was in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I am satisfied, and I have, I have seen this take place. I've experienced it in my own ministry to greater and lesser degrees. And that is, and I read this in a book, I had to see it defined by someone else to understand what was taking place. But it was the operations of the Spirit of God working in the preacher while he is preaching. And I have witnessed those times that I've walked away from the pulpit with the thought in my mind that that could not have possibly have come from me, that it was obviously that that was taking place. But I have also witnessed that during those times as well, there are the operations of the Spirit upon those who are receiving the Word of God, who are hearing the Word of God. And if you know the Lord this evening, I know that that has happened to you that it has taken place, not because of me, not because of any other preacher, not because of the greatest of them or the poorest of them, but simply because of the operation. Sometimes some of the simplest statements quickened um, um, under the power of the Holy Spirit is that which will have the most profound effect upon the life of an individual. And so it wasn't through logical per persuasion. He did not appeal to pride. In other words, what you can do. He did not allow for challenges to the grace of God. He did not allow for those actions wherein a person will say, Oh, I got saved. Guess what I did? I got saved. If you're saved, it will humble you. It will bring you in a state of humility. The humility of Christ is ever declared before us in his submission to the Father. And he would have us now to come in true humility before him, submitting unto that which he alone is able to accomplish within us. Our faith is to be registered fully in him. And so Paul's objective, and here it is, plain and simple, stated here in the word of God. Here is my purpose. Here is the henna thing. That is, this is the reason for it. This is why I have just said what I just said unto you. That, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That word there, it's the dunamis. It's the dynamite word. It's that word which explodes with ability within. It is that which enables, which, and we could use the word empowers, but we're trying to use uh, the same word to define what's already here. But it is the ability. And understand, look at, look at what he declares here. He uses the word twice, that it is in demonstration of the spirit and of, of power, divine ability. Divine ability working within you to accomplish that which honors God. 
And not only that, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, the ability of God to keep it going, to keep it functioning, to keep it laying hold on eternal life, to keep it honoring God, to keep it in full dependence upon Him, ever seeking to know Him, ever in pursuit of God, ever growing in His grace and in His knowledge. Oh, that indeed such might be what you are experiencing in seeing your faith being made to stand in the power or in the ability of God. May he bless you just now is my prayer.